we certainly have observed over time a steady increase in the rate of celiac disease and the rate of uh, non-celiac gluten sensitivity. Why? No one's thinking about maybe there's something in the wheat now that there didn't used to be there that's causing this problem. Multiple sclerosis, vitiligo, alopecia, thyroiditis, they always find a connection between that autoimmune disease and gluten. The wheat that has been developed now was developed for commercial reasons and of course it's laced with chemicals. Wheat is in everything. It's in everything. If you don't think we're in a crisis, you're not watching, you're not looking, you're not talking to teachers, you're not listening to parents because we have an extreme health crisis in our children today. When I turned 50 and leading up to 50, I started to gain weight. Uh, I got a very sore right hip, lower back pain. Uh, I had soreness here, tightness in my throat, and I just wasn't doing very well health-wise. So I went on elimination protocol, and I eliminated to the winter foods of the hunter-gatherer. So lean meats, uh, winter vegetables, and winter fruits was all I ate. And over a three-week period, I lost all the weight that I had gained over a period of a couple of years. All my aches and pains disappeared. Unbelievable clarity of mind, energy abounding. And I started to introduce foods back in. And I found that the biggest problem of all was wheat. Going back to culture and tradition for me was really important to understand why was wheat my problem and why did I see so many other people with a wheat issue and with a gluten issue. You know, it's the cultivation of wheat and other uh, of these agrarian products that has allowed civilization to spread. It's allowed exploration. It's given us a food uh, that was easily transportable, would not spoil and a very, very concentrated source of calories. The transition from the hunter-gatherer mode of existence, which constituted 99% of our prehistory before we started eating grains, uh, was like a dramatic shift in consciousness as well as a dietary shift. Wheat played a critical role in our becoming civilized. It enabled us not to be hunter-gatherers, but instead enabled us to be agriculturalists. Certainly without the development of agriculture, which involves grain products of some type, we would not have society as we know it today. If you look at the history of wheat, it's attained sort of glorified status secularly. The Food and Agriculture Organization, which is the UN's arm for defeating world hunger, has as its emblem a head of wheat. It's been glorified religiously as well as irreplaceably a representation of you know, the body of Christ. When you have such a profound set of memes deep within the substratum of the human psyche to indict the credibility of a very powerful industry uh, is, is, is really a radical thing in most people's eyes. We became a civilization because of wheat. That doesn't mean that it didn't come at a price. And traditional preparation techniques took a long time. For, they didn't have yeast, for example. They had a sour culture, and it took a couple days to make a loaf of bread. And it was basically a fermentation process. And all grains need fermentation to make it healthy. Today they have methods where they start with the wheat, and in two hours it's in the plastic bag as a loaf of bread. And so all of the anti-nutrients, all of the irritants that are naturally in wheat, all wheat, even ancient wheat, are still there because they prepared it so quickly. Those little tweaks were what enabled us to survive because sourdough uses certain types of yeast and there are other bacteria involved that will break down a lot of the proteins that we're talking about that can cause massive destructive changes in the body. So our culture and tradition taught us how to eat foods that may have otherwise not been good for us that are now uh, we're able to use properly. But we've thrown away culture and tradition. Dr. Kellogg's was a gentleman who was a vegetarian. He didn't like meat. He believed that um, people need to eat carbohydrates. He had a health farm in the early part of the 1900s uh, in the Midwest, uh, near where my mother was brought up. And he realized that we had trouble eating grain. And so he prepared 
the grain in a certain way so people could eat it. His early work was fairly profound in raising the awareness, at least here in America, uh, that food mattered in terms of health. Dr. Kellogg had the sanatorium where he was pushing a plant-based, high-fiber diet. So there was a gradual transition from a breakfast, a hearty breakfast that was meat and eggs or oatmeal with butter and cream to the breakfast cereals with skim milk. It was actually his brother that took on the whole role of Kellogg's Corn Flakes. And, you know, growing up in the 60s and 70s, Kellogg's Corn Flakes was the, the food to eat. Those Kellogg's Corn Flakes are wonderful. Well, do you know anyone who doesn't like Kellogg's Corn Flakes? Not a solitary soul. Really important problem at the time was that people were not getting enough calories. And unfortunately, that then exploded, and I think, in a direction that was maybe not anticipated at the time. Now, if you know your oats, and want to feel your oats. The initial rationale for breakfast cereals was quite noble, right? Let's, let's create a shelf-stable product that is going to allow people to get the calories they need to not die of starvation. Unfortunately, from there, it went to a place where now all of our calories are shelf-stable and convenient and devoid of actual vital nutrition. By the time um, we got to the 60s and 70s, they were fortifying it with minerals as well as vitamins. We've had to add vitamins and minerals to it in order to deal with, with malnutrition. The whole idea of fortification is we've taken out the bran and the germ, and so we're going to put these vitamins back in to replace them. Uh, they can hardly replace what we've taken out. The whole biological system has a natural way of working where when nutrients are present, they're present in context, and the context is everything else that's in that nutrient. Where are they getting these minerals from, and where are they getting these vitamins from? They're not getting them from food sources. They're actually getting them from chemical laboratories or mining them from the ground. Ansel Keys was instrumental in the sequence of events that led to us eating more and more wheat. Uh, Ansel Keys proved to be the harbinger of a, of a major global uh, indication that fat was to be demonized and that fat was responsible for just about everything bad you can imagine in the world. He reached the conclusion that it was the drop in the consumption of butter and eggs that was associated with the drop in cardiac mortality. He went to 21 countries, but only seven of those countries actually proved his theory that fat caused heart disease. He fabricated the story, really, about the relationship between cholesterol and, and heart disease um, by, by selecting nations that fit on his curve and throwing away all the rest. And it's amazing that, that his chart had so much impact on how we were told to eat. That same data could be examined and has been examined by other scientists to say it was the drop in sugar consumption that occurred at the same time that was associated with the drop in cardiovascular mortality. Fast forward to the present and the children are getting extruded cereal, you know, Cheerios, skim milk, sugar, uh, margarine, vegetable oils. There's nothing in that breakfast to nourish any part of the body. This was the beginning of fat being bad and carbohydrates being good. And this was the beginning of the end of bacon and eggs for breakfast and the beginning of breakfast cereals just soaring through the ranks of the favorite breakfast for the modern American household. There was a gentleman by the name of Norman Borlaug and he was a scientist that worked for the Corn and Wheat Board and they were wanting to mechanize the production of wheat. What his ultimate aim was, and I think it was a noble aim, was to feed starving countries, such as India and Pakistan. And they called it the Green Revolution. The Green Revolution performed two roles. First, it created a market for the chemicals that had no markets after the war, but it also allowed a different path for rural transformation. 
Monocultures in the landscape meant that there were more chemicals being put down. So a monoculture is where it's just one field of wheat or one field of soya or one field of corn and as a result of that and, and as a result of the chemicals that were being used and the unhealthiness of these plants, it all led to these plants becoming less and less resistant to disease and needing more and more chemicals in order to survive any pests that may want to eat them. Any monoculture will produce more of that. Monoculture is not such a big deal, uh, but it produces less of everything else that was displaced. What Borlaug did was take a wheat that had been stolen from Japan, called Norin, and crossed it. He hybridized wheat grain from different countries that would never have hybridized naturally together. The physics of this is that the shortening of the stem allowed more weight to be carried on top of the plant. The other thing was that it, it, was, it could be harvested a lot faster because you didn't have as much chaff. But see, in olden days, the chaff, the straw, the leftovers from the seed head, those were just as valuable as the seeds for bedding livestock. We had bred plants for balance, to give food for animals through the straw and humans through the grain. By the end of 1945, which was the end of the war, the people that were producing the chemicals for warfare began creating the chemicals for our agriculture. Instead of looking at the health of the plant, they looked at the yield of the plant. The wheat that has been developed now was developed for commercial reasons. It produces a much higher yield and it's far more profitable to grow and it's easier to grow. The yield has increased substantially and that has caused this pervasive abundance of wheat globally. And again, it really has caused us as a, as a world now uh, to be pretty much uh, founded on a, a notion that wheat needs to be an important part of our, our diets. Only the Western world produced enough grain to feed 11 billion people. 11 billion. We only have, what, short of 8 billion on the planet. So we are over producing grain. 690 million tons of wheat that are produced every year indicate just how much money is at stake. This is a very uh, difficult time for those who are more concerned about the truth and about what's best for our health versus, you know, the powers that be that don't, don't want people to know the truth about wheat. And I understand grain as being precious, but, but what, we, what we did was we took this, 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 um, this preciousness and suddenly gorged ourselves on its availability once we were able to figure out how to grow it limitlessly. And instead of just being grateful, we have, we have turned into, uh, you know, uh, an orgy of abuse. So here we are in the 1970s and 1980s. We've had the influences of seducing the housewife out of the kitchen with foods that were prepared, such as breakfast cereals. We've had the influence of Ansel Keys, more carbohydrates, less fats. We've now had Norman Borlaug produce a grain where we've got heaps and heaps of wheat available to us or monocultures available to us. And we're getting to the people of America are getting fatter, they're getting more disease, and nutritional guidelines uh, start to be introduced. So we created this higher carbohydrate, lower fat calorie uh, idea, which was called here in America the food pyramid, which was the most perverse uh, recommendation for human health that has ever been conceived. 
the history shows very, very clearly that the food pyramid was largely agricultural influences. The rationale that they were given when grains, which had been at the top of the original draft of the food pyramid, was suddenly put at the bottom was that, well, you know, poor people can't afford to have a, a diet that's based on fruits and vegetables and meats and seafood. When we first started uh, publishing the uh, food guidelines, uh, it was pitched to the agricultural community as uh, in another effective way to help market uh, their products. It is not based on any nutritional science. It is not based on any clinical or medical observation. It has been created by politicians who are protecting the interests of the wealthy. The food that we're eating as a society these days, that is extreme. And if you put a supermarket in the same spot 100 years ago and, and, and got people to walk in there and say, this is, this is the future of food, what do you think they would have said? They would have thought you were crazy. And they probably would have tried something. They thought, people eat this daily. And think about it. Wheat is probably the most problematic food in the modern diet. Uh, it doesn't need to be, but it's, it needs to be treated with respect and prepared properly. Over the last four, five, six decades, our wheat has changed dramatically, um, so much so that it doesn't even resemble what it used to. The way it's raised, uh, the hybridization, uh, the way it's processed, the additives, the amount that we're eating. So we're not only just being exposed to it, what we're consuming, but we're being exposed to it on our, our skin as well. So we now find wheat or parts of wheat in our cosmetics. We'll, uh, it's found in our supplements. It's found in our medications. It's uh, found in our additives, preservatives and flavorings. If you see the word glucose or maltodextrose or dextrose, these are all wheat-based sugars. Even ascorbic acid is made from wheat, and that's our vitamin C. So all of a sudden, because there's so much wheat around and they're realizing that they can manipulate wheat through chemical processes, it's now found in, in just about every corner of our life. Wheat is in everything. It's in everything, it's everywhere. And I think because it's such a subsidized crop, so it becomes such a, such a cheap ingredient. So it's, if you need an ingredient that is an anti-caking agent, well, you can use wheat starch. If you need an ingredient that's a binder, you can get a different chemical that's derived from wheat. You can use every part of wheat. So a lot of the chemicals that we see in uh, processed foods, in cosmetics, in cleaners, in shampoos, they come from the byproduct of, of wheat production for, for foodstuffs. And so we end up trying to use every part. We find uses for these chemicals that sh used to be thrown away and should be thrown away. You know, I see uh, a lot of folks who are taking vitamins and supplements. They fail to read their ingredients and may not realize that uh, it's probably contaminated with gluten or contaminated with wheat. Wheat straw extract is used in probably 80 to 90 percent of the skincare industry, so it is used a lot to help emulsify things. Wheat and gluten can be in many different forms, um, things as straight as wheat germ oil, um, right through things like um, wheat proteins, you can get um, there's definitely different forms of wheat that we put into the products that have gluten in them and often they're used as emulsifiers or emollients or they're used as surfactants. They're often used to help retain moisture in the skin so they are definitely a part of the skincare world. For me I'm always very very careful in picking what products. We don't even have Play-Doh in my house because it's made with wheat. I don't notice an immediate reaction if I use a shampoo that has gluten. But I notice it build up over time, that I'm starting to just feel less energetic. I'm starting to see joint pain. So I'm starting to see signs of inflammation in my body. This is a very individual re uh, response. Some people uh, can get by. They just have to have their diet clean, uh, but they seem to be OK in terms of their skin. Others are so sensitive, myself uh, being one of them, that if uh, somebody puts makeup on me that has gluten in it, 
uh, while it won't trigger my face pain, it does cause severe uh, burning, aching pain in my legs. In history, and not that long ago, probably in India in the 40s and 50s, many things were being grown on a land that then, you know, a decade or two later, was all one grain. All of these things helped resist diseases, resist pests, gave nutrition to uh, the people that lived and grew these foods. If it was an animal and plant society, the animals would fertilize the land and then the, the plants would be grown afterwards. So we actually used animals and plants. We used different plants to help other plants to um, survive and to be healthy. And that in turn gave us the nutrition that we needed in order to be healthy, strong human beings. Well, the basics are pretty simple. There is no animal-less ecology. Think about that. I mean, that sounds so profound, that sounds so simple, but it's elegant. There is no animal-less ecology. And yet all around the world, we're trying to grow grain and grow food with no animals. And the animals are confined in, in concentrated animal feeding operations here. Their manure develops dead zones here, and the chemical fertilizers from the grain production over here creates dead zones over there. Both systems become liabilities instead of both systems being tightly integrated into a regenerative package. As I continued to learn about wheat, I then started to look at our modern agriculture. My mother was born in 1937 in Iowa, USA, in the Midwest. In 1938 and 1939, there was a plague of locusts and they decided to use arsenic on the wheat fields and the corn fields in the Midwest. After that period, my mother, who was the oldest of 11, other siblings started to be born. So there were seven boys in that family. Six were born hemophiliac. Now hemophilia was never in our family. We went back generation after generation trying to find the gene. It wasn't there. Could it have been the chemical revolution, the arsenic that was being sprayed and the beginning of DDT being sprayed that may have caused the genetic change in my grandmother that then um, gave a family uh, so much to disease as far as hemophilia goes. By 1945, DDT was being sprayed, and DDT is now banned because of the ramifications of that chemical, but DDT was being sprayed on the cornfields and the wheat fields. And I remember being told by my mother that my grandfather was very much against the new chemical farming. But there were so many people that were for this. They said, this is the new way, this is the way that farming's going to go. But he had this sixth sense that it wasn't what we needed to do. One gram of, uh, of dirt in its natural state has an incredible number of living organisms within it that allows balance, that allows renewability. But the, you know, in modern agriculture, the soil is absolutely sterilized. We have been degrading land for a long, long time, but now it's, we're able to accelerate it. That, I think that's kind of what's changed in this century. That's why we're, you know, we're desertifying faster. We're, we're um, eroding soil faster. Up until two years ago, nature moved soil more than human activity. You know, dust storms, floods, ero you know, that sort of thing. And now humans move more soil than nature for the first time in human history. And that should give us pause. Chemical fertilization leaves your foods and crops deficient in vital mineral trace elements, micronutrients, because the soil is not getting those nutrients your soil is becoming desertified. Modern wheat has at least 10 applications of chemicals from start to finish, starting with a spray they put on the seeds to make them sprout. They have hormone sprays uh, to make their stalks strong, uh, hormone sprays to make them 
come into seed all at the same time, and then they have fumigants in the warehouse. So all of these chemicals are applied to wheat, and that's just the beginning. That's before they start processing it. Sir Albert Howard said it so well in 1943 in an agricultural testament. He said, when you use artificial manures to, grow art, to make artificial soil, it grows artificial plants, which then create artificial animals, which make artificial people who can only be sustained with artificials. It's really interesting to see how many foods are now today being thought of as toxic or as not good for us. You know, for example, wheat, and wheat is the staff of life. And now we say, oh no, wheat's not a good food. We shouldn't be eating wheat. And no one's thinking about maybe there's something in the wheat now that there didn't used to be there that's causing this problem. You still there, Hank? Yeah, kid. They sprayed us good, huh? Yeah, good. Oh, I never thought we'd get sprayed in the garden. <laughs> but we'll be okay, huh? I mean, we've been sprayed before, huh, Hank? Sure, kid. But I've got to tell you, my roots hurt real bad. Hank, whoever did this is going to pay. Hank, they're going to pay big. Hank, Hank. Roundup kills weeds where others can't. Roundup, no root, no weed, no problem. Roundup, you probably have in your garage at the moment or in your tool shed. You probably spray it on your grass. Your sports grounds are probably sprayed with it. Your parks are sprayed with it. Many of our foods are sprayed with it. It's everywhere. Glyphosate is the active ingredient in the pervasive herbicide Roundup, which is used uh, in chemical agriculture extensively and also used on people's lawns. And it's uh, unregulated, um, very poorly monitored actually, and very poorly measured. The glyphosate in the wheat is causing such a train wreck in the body that um, it's no wonder that we can't eat the wheat. We're seeing multiple different problems of the gut on the rise today in children as well as in uh, elderly people. Everybody, really, all ages are being affected. And I think the glyphosate is a major player in that problem. My big concern about Roundup is uh, what it does to the gut flora. And once you've got your gut flora me messed up, then digestion becomes very, very difficult. Now the argument in favor of using glyphosate that humans shouldn't worry about is because Glyphosate only affects plants and bacteria, okay? We are 10 times more bacteria than we are human cells. Therefore, glyphosate becomes a major issue for us to be real concerned about. They say we don't have the shikimate pathway as humans, which is what is disrupted in plants when plants get killed by Roundup. We have that pathway through the bacteria in our gut. The shikimate pathway is a process that happens in plants and bacteria and it converts fructose that we consume into a compound called PEP which then through a series of steps makes our beautiful aromatic proteins or amino acids which then turn into our neurotransmitters. 90% of our neurotransmitters are made in the gut. If we don't have the bacteria that make these neurotransmitters through the shikimate pathway, then we don't have enough neurotransmitters and therefore our brains don't work as well as they could. We don't think as well as we could. And it's amazing how many things come from the shikimate pathway, including, for example, folate, which is an essential B vitamin, and vitamin K, and um, serotonin, melatonin, melanin, dopamine, e um, epinephrine. These are all really, really important molecules in the nervous system. So as my journey continued in the discovery of why wheat could be such a bad thing when we needed it for culture and tradition, and I realized that not only were we destroying the plant and the nutrition of the plant and how we were consuming this plant, but we were also destroying our body's ability to digest it. And so you put those two combinations together and what you're left with is the perfect storm of insidious events with our health that are being caused as a result of us playing with nature. The fact that now we're growing it in a way where we're putting in, I guess, poisons would be the correct term for it, um, can't be serving anyone's health for the better. So as our society changes to one that is 
um, much more focused on, you know, work hard, play hard, and we sacrifice sleep, we sacrifice time in our own heads, we sacrifice stress management. At the same time as our diets are getting more and more nutrient void and richer and richer in inflammatory compounds, we are creating a perfect storm of events for chronic illness. And we are seeing not just an increase in celiac disease and gluten sensitivity, but we're seeing an increase in just about every chronic illness that we have the capacity to diagnose. We've exchanged infectious disease for chronic disease. And instead of appreciating where our technology would take us in, you know, being able to bathe more frequently and have refrigerators and, 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 and have more sanitation uh, and get us away from infectious disease and enjoy that, we simply let that pendulum swing clear over to, uh, to chronic and now we have type 2 diabetes and obesity and uh, you know, autism is through the roof. Wheat is contributing to an inflammatory state in our bodies, both by being inherently inflammatory and also by displacing foods in our diet that would allow us to have a more robust immune system. Even the poor are getting diabetes because they're living on a starch diet without any balance in their diet. I mean, a typical diet is, you know, pasta, bread, pizza crust, uh, and then uh, shredded wheat for breakfast, and biscuits and muffins, and all of that requires insulin to digest. And so you're just uh, creating a, a perfect situation for diabetes to develop. There's an overlap of all these symptoms going on. And these reactions can manifest as any group of symptoms under the sun. It can be a migraine headache, it can be an asthma attack, it can be a panic attack, it can be depression, it can be mood swings, it can be a skin rash, it can be a cystitis, it can be a nephropathy, it can be anything. You just can't continue to douse your food with neurotoxins and not expect it to show up in the human population. Simply thinking should make us head down a different path. In the wheat grain, it may not just be the gluten and the gliadin that is the problem, the, the, the proteins in our wheat. We also had sugar in the wheat, and that sugar is called fructan. And when we chop fructan up into little pieces, that's fructose. And one of the diseases that we're, or maladies that we're now seeing is fructose malabsorption. We're starting to understand that irritable bowel syndrome is at least in many cases is actually fructose malabsorption. So it's actually our bodies not being able to absorb fructose effectively and overfeeding bacteria. So we used to consume uh, large amounts of fructose for all of our existence, but we ate it in complex, in a natural food, such as a piece of fruit, which has millions of other substances in it and they're all necessary. They all balance each other out. If you take fructose out and present it on its own as a molecule to the human body, that can become toxic. The input to the shikimate pathway is PEP, phosphoenol pyruvate. And the step that glyphosate disrupts is the very first step that converts PEP to the next thing in the chain. And PEP is also the output of a pathway that breaks down fructose. So ordinarily, the gut microbes take in fructose convert it to PEP, and then the PEP supplies the input to the shikimate pathway. But what happens when glyphosate's in the way is that PEP piles up. And when PEP piles up, it's going to suppress the ability of the microbes to continue to break down the fructose. So the fructose is gonna end up in the lower gut and get processed into fat by the microbes in the lower gut, producing gas, for example. And if those microbes are not sufficient to manage all the fructose that's being eaten, then the fructose is going to go to the liver and the liver is going to have to process the fructose into fat also. And in doing so, the liver will become either fatty liver or it will release a lot of LDL particles giving you high cholesterol. Even if we were to right this moment just suddenly ban glyphosate, the soil itself would also be an issue because glyphosate in some soils, it can last over 20 years.
One of the things that I recognised is that my gastrointestinal tract was probably not working as well as it could. It wasn't digesting the wheat. And as I researched about the microbiome and realised the enormity of this amazing uh, group of organisms that help us have the nutrition we need, make our nutrition, digest our food, help us with our immunity, produce our neurotransmitters. It's, it's an, uh, an enormous job for a bunch of microorganisms. Uh, this collection of more than 100 trillion bacteria that live within each and every one of us that are really ultimately determining whether we're going to be uh, healthy or not, the balance point of our immune system, whether we have inflammation, whether we are fat or lean, and even play a role in our mood from moment to moment. Gut microbes are adapted to the environment that the person lives in, to the diet that the person is eating. Glyphosate wreaks havoc on our microbiome. It inhibits our ability to uh, have access to certain important minerals because it acts as a chelating agent and it down regulates our ability to utilize vitamin D. Your gut flora changes more and more towards being more pathogenic and more hostile for you than friendly. It stops serving you, it becomes unbalanced more and more. Our microbiome is passed on through the generations. So not only does the great grandmother give to the grandmother, give to the mother, give to the daughter, to the granddaughter, the genetics, they also pass on the microbiome. And I realized that my grandmother would have had a fairly intact microbiome to give to my mother. But through the chemical revolution, my mother's probably would have been slowly eroded, which she then gave to my sister and to myself, which I then give to my children. Children who are at high risk for celiac disease because of genetic markers are less likely to develop celiac disease if they have high levels of bifidobacteria in their gut. Bifidus is one of those parts of our microbiome that helps us digest our grains and helps us digest wheat and helps us break down the protein gluten into amino acids, which are easy for our body to use. It's very interesting to see that when you have dairy and wheat in your diet, you have high bifida. Um, if you don't, then those bifida disappear. But if you have bifida that are being harmed by a poison and you're eating wheat and milk, then the wheat and milk are going to become toxic. They're not, you're not going to be able to properly digest them and they're going to become problematic. First thing that's depleting bifidobacteria from the gut are antibiotics. I mean, they're very sensitive to antibiotics. They're very fragile organisms. And when I've done stool tests on patients, bifidobacteria are often missing. Every week, there's something published that adds to our understanding of the importance of these microbes and the way that they affect our health. What's the best source of bifidus? It's raw milk. And we kind of see milk and grains together. Well, uh, the raw milk has that bifidus factor in it. Once we pasteurize our milk, it's gone. So the raw dairy could very well be the missing factor for being able to digest wheat. healthy after I'd eliminated wheat from the diet is that I knew I had to, had to fix uh, my gut, which was a leaky gut, which means that I wasn't digesting the wheat. It was going into my blood system, which then was causing health issues. Gliadin 
The gluten protein that is in wheat has been shown to cause problem to the enterocytes in the cells lining the intestines, causing issues that may result in what we call leaky gut. And when your gut starts to leak, literally holes large enough to allow undigested protein molecules to enter the bloodstream, these open up and undigested protein molecules have an impact on the immune system. Healing the gut lining is job one uh, for dealing with virtually any degenerative condition or inflammatory condition that we experience, including diabetes, uh, joint pain, coronary artery uh, disease, uh, dementia, and even cancer. Let's look at the, the wheat protein, gluten, which divides into gliadin, which is the main issue when it comes to celiac disease. Gliadin or gluten is found in wheat protein. When we eat a protein, a normal protein, we eat it, it goes into our guts and our body pulls it apart into the individual amino acids and then we absorb these and then these building blocks, the amino acids, are reconstituted into human proteins. Unfortunately, gliadin or gluten cannot be digested. Gluten damages the gut, and when that happens, it exposes the insides of the damaged cells to the immune system. And one of those components is called tissue transglutaminase. That's an enzyme in the cells that is in nearly every cell in your body. Antibodies are made against that, so that it can get rid of the fragments of tissue transglutaminase. Now you have this crazy molecule that has glyphosate, transglutaminase, and, gl and gliadin all stuck together. And that molecule is, I think, what becomes the allergenic molecule. The body sees it as something it doesn't like, and it develops an uh, immune reaction to it. Now we've got what's called an immune complex, and this is a more difficult thing for the body to get rid of. And it has to put it somewhere, so where would it put it? Well, it often puts it in the immune complexes in the skin, which is, causes eczema or dermatitis herpetiformis in some specific cases. It can put it in the head and lots of people with brain problems have white plaques in their head from gluten complexes in the brain. It can go into the gut and cause all sorts of havoc there. But as I started to learn more and research more, I realized that the gut was not the only thing that was affected by wheat. Here I saw in my own body, I was being affected in my joints. But why did it affect my joints and my weight but it may att attack something else in somebody else. And what I realise is that the most important part of the body that's affected is the neural tree. And the neural tree is our nervous system, brain, spine, to our little finger. Everything could be affected, just depending on you know, your susceptibility. There are nerves going to every single cell and every single part of your body. So if you get damage to the neurological tree, you can get symptoms anywhere. We all know patients who have got celiac disease and all and patients who have gluten sensitivity who when they eat gluten within 10 or 15 minutes they've got symptoms. They've got gut problems, they've got bloating, they've got irritability, they've got headaches, they begin to itch and scratch. All within 15-20 minutes. That can't be symptoms from a disturbed gut. It can't be from the increasing gut damage causing you pain because the gut doesn't have that sort of pain sensation. So where do these symptoms come from? Well, it must be neurologically based. We can diagnose through tests celiac disease. We can diagnose a wheat allergy. But there's another part of this whole complex and it's called non-celiac gluten sensitivity. We can't diagnose that. We have no tests for it. The only way you will know whether you have non-celiac gluten sensitivity is if you eliminate wheat and see what happens to your symptoms. I'm a paediatrician and I see children with sore tummy, regurgitation, gastric reflux, headaches and migraines, eczema, itchy skin, chronic constipation, chronic diarrhea, not growing properly, irritability, attention deficit syndromes. Nobody can say without doing a blood test whether they've got celiac disease or not. So when you do the blood test and you find they don't have celiac disease, they can still react to gluten. 
Why do we see so much more celiac disease, gluten intolerance? Why is that, is that so prevalent now? And it comes in part from the fact that wheat is in more foods. It's a larger proportion of our diets. The wheat itself is now grown to have more problematic compounds because the problematic compounds in it actually make it more resilient as a crop to disease. So the same things that protect wheat from insects and, and disease are the same things that are the most inflammatory for our bodies. I've published uh, re uh, peer-reviewed journal articles on headache being related to gluten sensitivity. Dr. Marius Hajivasalu in England has published extensively on the neurologic consequences of non-celiac gluten-related uh, uh, sensitivity, uh, including cognitive issues and difficulties with how your brain works, uh, certainly mood issues, uh, we uh, have seen plenty of peer-reviewed data that even correlates schizophrenia with uh, gluten sensitivity. When I was brought up in the 60s and 70s, I remember one friend of mine having a sister who had celiac disease. Everybody could eat wheat, um, nobody seemed to have a problem with bread, pasta. But as the decades went past, and as I became a nutritionist, and I started to see more and more people have an intolerance to wheat, have issues with wheat, or have health issues that they didn't even know why they had those health issues. So with the, the cascade of events, the destruction of the microbiome, the increase in leaky gut, and the effect that it has on the neural tree, we're now seeing almost an epidemic of people with issues that our um, current medical system doesn't know what to do with, except perhaps give a medication to subside the symptom. But the idea is that we need to get to the cause. There is no part of the body that is um, immune from the damaging effects of, of, of gluten. And the reason being is that there's no part of the body that is excluded from the mechanism of inflammation. Uh, your joints can become inflamed. Uh, your heart, blood vessels become inflamed. We call that coronary artery disease. If you have gluten sensitivity, you're at much higher risks for learning disabilities, psychiatric problems, uh, other neurologic disorders, and now unfortunately uh, physicians um, on average see less than 15 hours of nutrition education in their four years of medical school. All they know is the drugs. That's why uh, physicians, that's all we're telling our patients is, you have this illness, use this drug. When my sister was diagnosed with an autoimmune disease back in the 1980s and her disease was Crest, I'd never heard of it. I didn't even learn about it in school. Yet now we are seeing a phenomenal growth in autoimmune diseases. In actual fact, there are more than 100 diseases that have been indicated to be autoimmunity. The prevalence of autoimmune conditions is soaring. Uh, here in America, it's been estimated that about 17% of us suffers from an autoimmune condition, and that's, that's breathtaking. So what does autoimmunity mean? It means that the body has lost its intelligence to know what is its friend and what is its enemy. The immune system has, has suddenly lacked, uh, uh, developed a situation where it cannot determine self versus non-self, where your body's immune system is reacting against your own tissue, as we see in lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, celiac disease, type 1 diabetes, multiple sclerosis. So it might attack your thyroid, your joints, uh, your brain, which ends up in Alzheimer's and dementia, kidneys, heart, blood vessels, pancreas. So instead of attacking viruses and bacteria that are entering from the outside, it starts to attack the proteins, which look like the bacteria and the viruses, on the inside. We have this growing collection of studies linking gluten to autoimmune disease. And in fact, in every study in which we've looked to see if there's a link, we have found one. 
we are starting to put together that an intolerance to gluten may be part of all autoimmune diseases. Is wheat uh, sensitivity at the root of every autoimmune case? Uh, probably not, but leaky gut is probably at the beginning of every autoimmune illness. But for many, many, gluten will have been that first step. Because I believe that gluten does trigger autoimmune disease and the autoimmune doctors, when they study gluten and they study their disease, for instance, multiple sclerosis, vitiligo, alopecia, thyroiditis, all these diseases, they always find a connection between that autoimmune disease and gluten. Autoimmune conditions are life-threatening. People die from autoimmune conditions. So uh, I, I make sure as best I can that my patients get the message that they've got to ditch gluten 100%. Autoimmunity uh, requires, as we know today, three main factors. One is our genetics, two is the environment, so the food you consume, the chemicals around you, and the third is what protects your body from the outside world, and that is the gut lining. By becoming aware of your environment, the chemicals that are in it, the way your food is produced, then you can turn on a new set of genes. You can turn on the genes for health. We haven't changed genetically, but we have absolutely changed epigenetically, meaning how we're controlling our genome. We now recognize that our gene profile is actively interacting with our food, with our lifestyle, how much sleep we get, the level of stress that we have. All of these factors are changing our genetic expression moment to moment, and empowering is the notion that about 70% of our genes that are involved in health and longevity are controlled by factors over which we have control, diet being very important uh, in, in terms of those factors. I've been studying epigenetics and it's quite remarkable how quickly uh, things can, can go downhill. There's a generational effect. Sometimes these things get worse with the next generation. So there's a memory at the epigenetic level. You know, there's been a lot of concentration on the genes and looking at the mutations and thinking in terms of um, proteins being made incorrectly. But there's a whole other level to DNA um, that's probably much more complicated and much more important than the actual gene sequence of the genes. And this has to do with these modifications to the DNA that happen for example, during development, so methylation of the DNA. And methylation depends upon methionine, and methionine is depleted by glyphosate. So when you don't have enough methionine, then the DNA gets hypomethylated in the brain, and that is, has been linked to autism. So uh, it's really scary to think about the consequences. Every bite of food we take has a hormonal impact within the body, and that we have this incredible ability to affect how our genes express themselves. Our genes do not act in a vacuum. Our genes aren't self-determined. Our genes require input from us to turn on or off. I think all of this comes down to personal responsibility and uh, choices and a willingness to, um, to take on a role primarily for oneself. The first order of business is to fix your own house and to clean up your own house and get, and get yourself in good condition. One of the things that you start to do is start listening to your body. Look at from the tip of your head to your little toe and scan your body as to what are the problems that are happening now. Because more often than not what we do is we stop listening to our body and we just take a medication to dull the symptom. If the body is whispering at you with any condition, be it a headache, rheumatoid arthritis, a skin condition, an eczema dermatitis, then I would be looking at everything. I would be looking at what I'm putting into my body first and foremost because we know that healthy cells grow from the inside out. But then what I'm putting on the outside is just as important to me. I remember when I had to give up wheat and I realised that uh, if I didn't give it up then I was going to keep gaining weight and I was going to have some real issues with my musculoskeletal system. 
And I remember I, I loved going to the local bakery. He was a traditional baker, organic. I'd buy his sourdough breads. And every now and then on an afternoon, I'd go and get these beautiful croissants. And I, I really remember having a, a little bit of a fit saying, these are the foods I want to eat. I want to eat these foods. A lot of people who, when you first suggest that maybe they're going to have to give up grains, uh, sort of, they, they can't believe that's even possible. What will I do? How will I exist without my uh, cereal in the morning, without my bread on a sandwich? How will I eat a sandwich? That's my favorite one. How will I eat a sandwich? And, and that's an interesting uh, first pass when, you're, when it's suggested that you might have to give up these because of the addictive nature of, of grains and wheat. So are wheat products addictive? Well, you ask someone to give them up and you look at the fear in their face. And I know that the fear comes from, or what am I going to cook? Or what am I going to eat? I think the fear comes from, I really like eating that. Don't take that away from me. That's, that's the one thing that gets me through the day. That's the one thing I look forward to each and every day. Both casein and gluten can be converted in the liver to a morphine-like derivative. It's called an endorphin. And the casein one is called caseomorphine and the gluten one is called gluteomorphine. And these substances, yes, morphine, endorphins, they go to the brain and they give a great sense of high. This is, I feel great. That's why they're called highs. And the children like that feeling. They don't know they're addicted. The parents don't know they're addicted, but they've got this craving to have wheat and dairy. We've got no shortage of calories in our food system. We've got a shortage of nutrients, not a shortage of calories. And so when you have a food that has no nutrients, but it's calorically dense, it's delicious, it triggers the same type of responses in our brain that we would get triggered from, from a drug, right? So we can actually see food addiction relating to highly palatable, nutrient deficient foods. And so it makes it a really difficult food to explain how it can be so detrimental to our health because it's delicious. Giving up wheat doesn't mean you can consume or eat gluten-free packaged foods. When you have a look at these gluten-free packaged foods, they may say they're gluten-free, but you read the ingredients and what you see is a bunch of additives, preservatives and flavorings and all different other carbohydrates and other grains that uh, when they're mixed together, you don't know what they're doing in your body. Well, the problem with wheat today isn't as simple as just finding gluten-free labeled foods because they're found in our cosmetics, they're found in our pills, you know, medications, they're found as fillers, there's certain sweeteners that are made from wheat. So the problem is that if you are really sensitive to gluten, you're going to be exposed to it unless you're hypervigilant. Have I ever bought a gluten-free product uh, that actually said gluten-free as a substitute? No. Would I? Probably not, because generally they're made up of things that I don't want to be eating anyway. Um, I, it's, it's difficult because there's so much misinformation out there and, and I think people just aren't informed. And then they see a gluten-free packet or a gluten-free aisle and think, okay, that must be better for us because I, sh I, be, I shouldn't be eating gluten. So then they go for something in, in a packet that's got all these different starches and binders and fillers and, and numbers and chemicals. The problem is when you walk down that aisle, what do you see? Gluten-free cake, uh, gluten-free pastries, gluten-free cookies, crackers, bread, uh, make-at-home bread, you name it. So while you're gluten-free, you are pounding your body with carbohydrates and that is wreaking havoc on your gut bacteria, on increasing risk for gut permeability and amping up inflammation. The market now identifying water as gluten-free. So on some level, there's a dumbing down of anywhere they can slap the label on any product. It's going to make it sell better, but it's an insult to our intelligence. You need to be zero gluten because you don't want to stimulate your gluten antibodies. The studies have shown that if you have one bite of bread a day, that's enough to fuel celiac disease and keep it going. You'll never heal at that. We need to nurture these people through their condition. We need to ensure that they remain zero gluten. And we need to make sure that they understand why they are having to be so careful. So I'm not so worried about the gut, I'm worried about the brain.
the FDA in America just this year have set the limit for gluten-free at 20 parts per million. If it's got less than that, then it's okay to be gluten-free. I disagree with that absolutely entirely. Allowing gluten-free products to be 20 parts per million allows manufacturers to cross-contaminate in the factory. They don't have to have a gluten-free facility. Some people cannot tolerate a microgram of gluten without them setting off an inflammatory response. I'd rather see you go zero gluten. And zero gluten means that you know where each one of your individual ingredients are coming from and you're making foods from those ingredients. So you're making the foods yourself. You're going back to our culture and tradition. Your tradition of being in the kitchen, making beautiful food from scratch. Back to the basics versus relying on medications, even a lot of supplements that may have gluten as an excipient may not be as good of an idea as using a culinary uh, herb or taking in a certain type of food. So part of this calls us back to going into more of a, a natural way of living, a natural way of eating, where you wouldn't even consider consuming all these gluten-free labeled products because you're really making your own food, you're eating whole foods, which are intrinsically gluten-free vegetables and high quality fr you know, fruits and, and, and nuts. Taking it one step further, you know, the skin is a massive part of the body and it does absorb ingredients. But where I'd go with that is I'd be going chemical free. I'd be looking at the same principles and philosophies of going as close to nature as possible. So for me, that's cold pressed oils. That's using things like essential oils, avoiding the chemicals and anything that has numbers and any chemical components. When I talk to people that I had given up wheat and I've given it up for quite a long time, you can see this glaze over their eyes and they're like going, give up wheat? Well, what do I eat now? They have no idea what to eat. They don't know anything different from breakfast cereals. They only know their sandwiches, their muffins, their crackers and their pasta. But what am I going to eat, Pete? What, what's left to eat? Because if I can't have my bread or I can't have my cereal, you know, this is stuff that I've been eating for the last five decades, each and every day. Can I tell you a little secret? You have a wonderful world open to you of flavour of textures, of ingredients. The most blandest food on the face of the planet would have to be grains, or especially wheat. I mean, you think about it. You think about a packet of flour, whether it's wholemeal or, or white. Taste it. Does that taste delicious to you? I think education is the key. And using yourself as a bit of, a, bit of a guinea pig. I mean, for instance, this documentary is about wheat. I can tell you with all honesty, if you give up wheat, you are not going to die from a deficiency from it. At one point, my wife just said, hey, you know, why don't you uh, just give up grains? You're, you're writing all this stuff about what's in them. Why don't you just try it yourself for 30 days and see what happens? And, and it really was that, that little experiment that I did um, about 17 years ago, uh, where I gave up grains for 30 days and all of a sudden that IBS that I'd suffered with my entire life that had literally dictated uh, you know how I went about my day where was the the next available bathroom on my route to wherever I was going or wherever I was um, that IBS went away uh, the arthritis in my fingers that I was assuming was a natural artifact of getting older that went away I, I no longer got the gastroesophageal reflux I never got the the heartburn, the sinus issues that would linger after a cold or, or a flu went away. Imagine how many tens of millions of people are experiencing the same sort of issues and don't really know that it's as a result of food choices, but they assume that it's a natural artifact of their life, of their genetic constitution, uh, of their history of eating, uh, or just a natural artifact of getting older. What I've found working with hundreds of people is if they eliminate wheat, they start to see an improvement in whatever health issues, either acute or chronic, that they're dealing with. I mean, there's nothing in medicine that is as dramatic, except maybe antibiotics for an infection, as eliminating an allergic trigger that is crippling an individual. And now I switch to only organic food and personal care products. That's when the magic began. 
And that's when I, in the course of a year, would go from sort recline wheelchair to biking 20 miles with my family. I, I'm so grateful for those years in the wheelchair because without the four years in the wheelchair, I would not have learned all of this. And I would still be thinking that drugs and surgeries would be how we're gonna create health for our country. And that could not be farther from the truth. Drugs and surgeries will not create health for uh, the US or any westernized country or for the world. We have to go back to diet and lifestyle. We have to go back to eating veg this radical thing known as vegetables, lots of them, sufficient uh, uh, protein, not lots of protein, sufficient protein. And we need to move our bodies. We need to have a meditative practice, a supportive social network, uh, and hopefully a, a loving family. That is how we create health. That's how we control healthcare costs. That's how we defeat chronic disease. Give it a go. Let's say you have non-celiac gluten sensitivity. You can't do a test for it. All you can do is eliminate. So give yourself six weeks to eliminate wheat, but do it with real foods. Well, being a chef, I think I had a little bit of an advantage to adopt this lifestyle to make it delicious. Uh, because that's the key. With any dietary change, you don't want to be eating cardboard. You really want to be eating really delicious food. And we found that the transition for the children, especially our kids, we actually really didn't need to tell them anything. I just cooked food that was devoid of the ingredients that can cause problems for our children and for ourselves. We didn't make a big song and dance about it. It becomes really important to change the conversation, not away from what we're eliminating, but from what we're, what we're adding. What other amazing, tasty, flavorful, nutrient-dense foods we can eat in place of wheat? The first week or two, they may feel worse because they are now up regulating the enzymes that process eliminate toxins and uh, they're experiencing some, what we call detoxification. They may have more headache, more fatigue. The women are coming in, Doc, I'm losing weight, uh, I'm, I'm not hungry, I feel great. So they're very happy about body image. The guys, on the other hand, are coming in like, Doc, you didn't tell me my love life was gonna improve, I am so happy. So how long it takes to recover from an exposure can vary dramatically. The cells that are responsible for the reaction can live anywhere between two months, 10 months, two days. The cells that calm everything down and turn off that reaction, if they're not working properly, you're gonna be on the 10 month side. If you have been consuming wheat your whole life and that intestinal wall has been constantly challenged, it's constantly inflamed and it's permeable, just eliminating the offending substance could in theory start generating healing response within a matter of a few days or a week. You really wouldn't know until you stopped consuming it. And many of us who have done that have been just shocked by how profound the changes uh, and how quickly they have occurred, as well as when they reintroduce even a small amount of that substance, just what a acute reaction they get. So you'll often hear people say, you know, I ate bread every day of my life and I never had these kinds of reactions to it. And, and it's sort of a common response that people will think that you know, going gluten-free for a month made them gluten intolerant. And that's not the case. It allowed them to see what was already there. So you have these exaggerated response, which makes it really, really obvious. And it makes it really, really easy to identify which food was the problem. Not everybody will have an issue with weight. It just seems that the majority of the population is beginning to have a problem with weight. So will I be able to eat wheat again? Do I need to do this elimination? Is there an alternative? We do not have the science to say, yes, you can eat wheat again, or no, you shouldn't be eating wheat again. It is about you figuring out what is the best thing for you. Some people are able to eat wheat again, and some people are not. With a food intolerance, many people will find that eventually they can start to, to reintroduce that food into their diet successfully because you've actually allowed enough time to pass for all of the cells, not just the ones that are controlling the reaction, but the ones that are responsible for the reaction to die off. And it's why food intolerances are such a dynamic system. If I were to choose to eat a type of wheat product, um, I would probably choose something like sourdough rye. 
and would really look for traditional organically grown and I think my body would probably end up being okay uh, at some point or at least you know help me to maintain my health better than if it was another form. We need to go back to the old-fashioned wheats, the einkorn, the emmer wheats that haven't been manipulated. We need to raise them organically without Roundup, without all these chemicals. And then we need to grind them fresh and make a genuine sourdough bread. If we go back to the ancient grains, the, the ones that, that originated, we may find that more people could tolerate these. The philosophical question is why, why do you even want to do that when you have meat, fish, fowl, eggs, nuts, seeds, vegetables of all kinds, some fruit, uh, which are providing a, a, a ton more nutrition uh, on a calorie per calorie basis. If more and more people start to eat nutrient dense foods, then they probably don't need to eat as much of it. If we start to treat the land holistically and work with nature, then potentially we do not need as many wheat fields, corn fields, sugar fields as we currently have. I mean, we use a lot of the land for ingredients that really aren't causing us to have great health. So let's start taking care of it properly and let's start getting back to the older ways which sustained us and got us here. Because you don't have to come back from a rotten toxic route, you just have to abandon it. And abandoning toxics is a very simple gesture of recognizing that ecological agriculture is totally possible, that we can renew the fertility of our soils by giving back to the earth the organic matter that she has given us, and she will sustain us forever into the future. If we have to have a future as humanity, it's time to bring life back into the equation, and with it, the knowledge that comes through culture, because only culture teaches us that life is precious. Wheat isn't the problem, it's what we've done to wheat that's the problem. And I feel we need to go back, back to our old ways of having a veggie garden in the backyard so we know where our food is coming from. Or follow the town of Todd Morden, which is an edible town where they grow food trees and, and food instead of pretty trees and, and flowers. And if we start going back to our traditional ways and we start taking an interest in how our food is produced, then perhaps so that we can stop this onslaught of um, illness that we're now seeing within our children and our adult population. Every disease that exists on the planet is a man-made creation. Nature has not created those diseases. We have created them. And that's a wonderful news because we have the power to reverse them. I'm very optimistic that a large part of the public is going to understand that we will not be able to medicate or operate our way back to health. The only way to get health and vitality is to go back to what really caused us to become ill in the first place, which was our diet and lifestyle choices. The food that we eat is sending signals to our DNA, our code of life. And we can either choose to send signals that code for health or signals that code for disease. Our genetic code hasn't changed and it's expecting that information from the foods uh, that we've been eating for a long, long time. And again, modern agriculture has suddenly given us genetic information that our bodies just don't know how to handle. What impact are we having on the next generation as a result of the food choices that we're making right now? And to, to see the light go on and go, wow, this is not just today, but I can see that I can improve for the next few decades and that, and that probably the best of all is that this is a very sustainable way of eating. It's not a diet, it's a way of eating. And it is incredibly uh, uh, satisfying and clearly sustainable for the rest of my life. So eat the way our ancestors ate. And there, there is really no other solution. I know that you might need other health modalities to get back to health, but without starting with the, the right diet, uh, nothing else is gonna work. We're creating a weaker and weaker species, and are we gonna do something about it? I know I want to, I know you want to, I know parents watching this want to, you know, I believe we can turn this around. Use what you have, where you have, blossom where you are, sprout where you are, and 
and, and then keep your eyes open and start making collaborations and talking to this and that and the other. Be gentle with the skin, be gentle with the body. It's taken a lot to bombard it. We've hurt the skin, we've hurt the body. Let's get back and start nurturing in the way nature intended. Be kind. One of the biggest roadblocks that we face to change is that we as an entire society have forgotten what it feels like to be healthy. The reason behind the education with What's With Wheat and this documentary is to get you to ask more questions, to be more aware, to understand what's happening out there, to take an active role in how your food is produced. And we can't change with the thinking that's got us into this predicament. We must change with a different type of thinking. Become educated, become knowledgeable, become aware, start making changes step by step, habit by habit, and we may be able to create a tsunami of change that will change the health of our children and future generations.